Welcome to Charter California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the Congresswoman elect. Her name is Gloria Negretti McLeod. She was a member, I guess, are you still a member of the California State Senate? I am. You still are a member of the California State Senate. We congratulate you on a tremendous victory. I think it's fair to say that until the end, it's a victory many did not expect. Is that fair to say? That Casting is fair. Casting no aspersions? That but, is fair to say. So what went right? What went right? We ran a truly honest-to-goodness grassroots campaign. Right. And you took out a long-term incumbent, uh, Joe Baca, a Democrat. Uh, didn't happen very often where long-term incumbents lost. Actually, a couple uh, in California uh, to intra-party losses. We know that Pete Stark lost in Northern California. But let's not talk about losses. Let's talk about wins. How excited are you? How was it to be back in Washington for orientation? Very busy. Right. Very busy. Every day you were busy, uh, you know, telling you the rules and the things and what you right. have to learn. Right. Have you hired your staff? I have. And I was speaking with Congressman-elect Alan Lowenthal, and he mentioned to me that there was a lottery to see who gets the best freshman offices. And one of your colleagues from California, Julia Brownlee, picked number one out of 70 or 80. Mm -hmm. You picked number? 43. Okay, so right in the middle. Not so bad. Do you have a sense of what committees you will be on? Yes, uh, you, I'm on agriculture. Which makes, I mean, you think about the communities you serve. Well, there's also a lot of subcommittees that work with that. Right. And so that, Do you get two assignments or one? Two. We will get two. The next one is in the next go around. So you don't know what you're going to get yet. after that. So Not how do you yet. feel about ag? Well, I, it was my second choice. Okay, so no not, not my first there. choice, but my Can second. Can you say what your first choice was? It was transportation. Which I know is very, very popular. I want to speak with you about uh, a tragedy that happened in our nation in Connecticut. We know that we lost 26, 27 souls as a result of a horrific incident at an elementary school. And the reason I'm speaking with you about it is I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons that you won was that the mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, was opposed to your opponent, Joe Baca, who had been a very strong supporter of the NRA. He ran an independent expenditure campaign to your benefit. I'm taking nothing away from your victory. You know, it, it's your victory. But I do think it's fair to say that that played a role. That so, played a role so, in a higher percentage of me winning. Right. I think I... I feel confident that I as would have do, won, as do but, I. I, but the, the margin would have been right. much smaller. Right. It was, you, you trounced. You trounced. But, but then, I, because of that, I'm sure I'm not the first person that has asked you about the gun control debate because of the contours of your election. I know you're not um, a member technically yet, but what can you tell us about the chatter surrounding the gun control debate? Well, uh, in every, every time there is an issue, whether it's gun control or whether it's something, whether it's in the state legislature or in the federal government, uh, people become very obsessed almost about whatever tragedy it is and then all kinds of legislation comes out. I have neither been a gun supporter nor a gun negative. That, that's you what's know? interesting. Yes, you haven't yes. been known one way or the other. No, Mr. Baca no. was. No, Mr. Baca was, way. but I, not, not right. me. Uh, as I have said before, uh, we do have guns in our house. So, you know, my husband was a former police officer, okay. so then it, it's a natural right. consequence of what you have. And so we do have guns in the house. They're in a safe. Uh, I don't shoot, uh, but I do believe in the Second Amendment. However, this tragedy that happened in Connecticut is, is, uh, has now brought it to the fore about gun control and uh, you know, assault weapons and, and those. And what's so interesting, if I may, I would have thought that the the massacre that almost took the life of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords would have brought it to the fore. I would have thought the Aurora massacre in Colorado would have brought it to the fore, and it did for a week or two. But this massacre seems different. Is yes. that fair? Yeah, I would think so. And while I believe in the Second Amendment, I don't think that we need. Uh, those assault weapons. I mean, if you really are a hunter or a thing, you don't need right. those. And, and what we know, and it's very interesting, is that in California, our laws are much more restrictive than they are in other states or the nation. And it's questionable if, for example, the shooter in Connecticut could have had what's known as the bushwhacker, I think that's the name of the gun, um, in this state. 
because I understand it may have been illegal in this state, but not in Connecticut. Oh, okay. But but that being said, you are now in the federal scene. And so there are discussions about whether we should have a federal law, for example, limiting magazine size. In California, it's up to 10. There's no national law on that. And, and I don't see any anything wrong with that. I mean, if you're a hunter, I don't think you shoot elk 10 <laughs> times, you get, right. you know. So again, I believe in, in, in having, uh, if that is your, your right mm -hmm. to have a gun, but we don't need all of the extra things. And, and also, but there was another issue with, with this young man that, that did this. I think there was some incidents, according to what everything I've read, of, of mental illness. And, and let's talk about that because I'm, I'm sure you've heard about this article that's circulating. Um, I am a, a Adam Lanza's mother about a woman who has a mentally ill child and is just screaming out for help. And you know, I, I am Adam Lenz's mother is a metaphor because what do you do? What do you do? I mean, mental illness, you can't you can't touch it, you can't test for it. What and do you do? and there are rights that every human person has that when they reach a certain age, he they're adults. Adult, right. And if you're an adult, you cannot uh, force someone to take treatment. You cannot force someone to take your medications. So how do we handle that? How do we single out those people that are mentally ill and, and force them, so to speak? We all want to help the mentally ill. How many people do we see on Skid Row that are mentally ill that, that they don't choose to take their medicine, so then they go off the deep end. So, so, so what, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? I mean, and, and the question is, is it, is it a city issue? Is it a county issue, a state issue, a federal issue? I mean, at some level, I'm wondering, being a member of Congress is really not much you can do on the mental health side. That's really a local issue, or maybe there is. I don't know. I think maybe it's, it's society's issue. How do we handle it as a society? How do we help those people that are mentally ill to, in fact, keep them on a regiment of taking medications so that it stabilizes them so they don't do this. Now, I don't know what the particulars are of this young man, right. or what caused him to do this, or what precipitated I mean, there are reports, and again, we don't know if they're true or not, that part of the reason he chose to kill his mother is she was looking to institutionalize him, to put him in a mental hospital. Mm. And it's just what you suggested. When someone's an adult, there's only so much you can do. But I am concerned, especially about those families where there is mental illness in uh, uh, kids that are 5 to 17, let's say, you know, when they're still in the home. There's not enough facilities. In California, there's not enough facility to handle all of that. There's not enough technicians. There's not enough uh, professional people to actually take care of the mentally ill. And you know, I don't know, when I was a kid, there was probably a lot of mentally ill people that we didn't mm -hmm. even know. Everybody mm -hmm. used to say, well, you know, he's kind of right, different. Odd. Right, on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there chatter in Washington, you've already been back, about looking to create some type of federal solution on no, the mental because illness we, side? We, this occurred way after we left. Okay. Uh, we were there, oh, the last time we were there was late November. I understand. So, this so that being said, is it on your radar to look at limiting the number of magazines uh, or, or bullets in a magazine or limiting, uh, preventing uh, requiring that there be background checks for guns sold at gun shows, which is in California, but not nationally. Are those types of things on your radar? I, I don't think those are very intrusive. I, I know there are people who would disagree right. with me. And I know that everybody says, and, and I tend to believe this, that that guns don't, don't kill. kill people. It's people that kill but, people. But it's access. Yes, but it's arguably. access. Yes, uh, well, this young man... Uh, they weren't his guns, but his mother had right. the legal right to have them. And so. she was a gun collector. Yes. So, so it gets very dicey. I want to say again, congratulations Thank on you. your victory. I know that the people of the Inland Empire are very excited to send you to Washington, D.C. Her name is Gloria Negretti McLeod. She is a new member of the United States Congress. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the president of Scripps College. Her name is Lori Bettison Varga. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest is the president of Scripps College. Her name is Lori Bettison Varga, and it is my pleasure to meet you. Scripps College, of course, is part of the Claremont College, is one of five. It is a single sex institution for women. Congratulations on joining Scripps about four years ago now. That's right, yeah. I'm in my fourth year. And so let's talk about Scripps before we talk about your focus, which is science. Tell me more about Scripps. So Scripps is a women's college, as you right. said. We're one of five undergraduate institutions in the consortium. Long well known, I think, in the Southern oh, California yes. area, but pr pr primarily because of arts and humanities, yes. arts education. Yes, no doubt about that. When we think about the Claremont College's Harvey Mudd is right. the science institution, right. Scripps is the outstanding humanities institution right. for women. And that's what people have thought for a long time. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, you know, 25% of our students will have science and math degrees at graduation. And they're getting their degrees from Scripps. They're not yes, from Scripps. cross um, no. enrolling at Harvey Mudd. No, they can take classes at all of the schools in the consortium. But we have our own science department. It's the Keck, WM Keck Science Department that we share with Pitzer and Claremont right. McKenna College. I colleges. think I interviewed someone on, on that a couple right. months ago. Right, right. But let's talk about science because you, Madam President, are a scientist. You are a geologist. Yes. And for better or for worse, we don't see a lot of women as scientists, let alone geologists. No, that's right. <laughs> let alone geologist scientists that are presidents of institutions. That's true. Yeah. So that's true. Talk to me about your journey to, as a PhD in geology and then what you'd like to do in terms of bringing that journey to other women. Well, I started uh, science, interest in science early on, Great, right. but I didn't get connected to geology until I was in between my junior and senior years uh, in high school. I went to Long Beach Poly High School. Ah, of course, one of the finest. Yes. Yeah, still All is. the scholars and champions, yes, indeed. Still is one of the finest. So yeah. uh, I was invited to uh, apply for a National Science Foundation summer workshop at Long Beach City College in wow. between my junior and senior years. N now, how did that happen? Because let's face it, I mean, I think we're probably around the same age. Yeah. I don't think girls were being asked to apply for science, for science. You know, I mean, I hate to say that. I can't even tell you how right. I got invited, but I know it came across, you know, we got the mail at home and it was on earthquake studies. Okay. And I had been I'm fascinated afraid too. <laughs> oh, afraid. of earthquakes, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn about earthquakes. And mm -hmm. I fell in love with the science, mm -hmm. the geology. The professor took us up to UC Santa Barbara and he took us out in the field. And, and think about how that program changed your life. Absolutely. That no, one absolutely. program, and that is my dream, not just for girls, but for boys. You know, but we'll right. focus on girls for now since I have two daughters, and yes. it's all about girl power right now. But, but how can we create those magic moments for our daughters? Well, you know, and I think those, there's a lot of talk about that right now, but it even goes above and, uh, above and beyond that. Mm. So imagine when you're out with your daughters, what mm. do people say to them when they see them? Oh, look how pretty you are, how cute you are. You're such a great dancer. Exactly. You've got beautiful hair. Right, exactly. And, and Lisa Bloom, she's written a book about sure. this. Sure, Laurie Allred's daughter. Right. She's, mm. she's terrific on this. She says, you know, when I meet uh, a girl, I say, what are you reading right now? Mm. What are you learning in science? What's your favorite That's class brilliant. in school? Because the way that we, you know, inter interact with girls is how they develop their impression it, of themselves. It's interesting. I have two athletic daughters, despite their gene pool. Right. Despite their gene pool. And <laughs> I'm sure you're good at that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. But be that as it may, it is something that's interesting. I mean, even God bless my father doesn't quite know how to interact with an athletic yeah. girl. Yeah. You no, know? it's interesting. It, 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 it's a challenge. And as I mentioned to you, you know, fifth grade, third grade, hard to get a sense of their interest. But I think it's fair to say my fifth grader um, is no doubt interested in science. I mean, I can hear right. it, I can feel it, I can taste it. Um, but I feel inadequate. Yeah, well, you need to get her involved in any kinds of experiences that are available. In fact, my daughter and I were having this conversation, mm -hmm. and she and she's took, a ninth grader? She's a ninth grader, mm -hmm. and she took part in a program sponsored by AAUW called um, Expanding Your Horizons, and it's only for fifth and sixth grade girls. Can you please give me that information? And, because you know, we need something for the summer. Well, the interesting thing is, is it was a one-day event. Oh, and, oh, and this was when we lived in Walla Walla. And Washington State. Yeah, right. exactly. And she said, Mom, it transformed That's my the thinking. That's magic moment. So That's you just need that magic moment and then you know it's not just having women role models it's any mentor male or female at the same time you take a very different approach than I would have expected you want your scientists who happen to be women also to be experts in humanities absolutely explain that because that's an angle I haven't seen well so I think uh, and certainly liberal arts colleges 
believe that what they do, what right. our educational power is in critical thinking and clear communications, effective communications, are not argumentation, building a case mm -hmm. you know, from the facts. And so all of our students take this interdisciplinary humanities core curriculum. And for me, I think the power for our science students is that they have a different way of thinking now about the implications of their work as scientists. They have a humanistic perspective about what it is that they're doing. It's interesting, Steve Jobs, the legendary yes. Steve Jobs. Tell me about that. I have to admit, I didn't research this. Your great aide did. <laughs> what did Steve Jobs tell us? Well, he, he basically told us that the magic of Apple is that the innovation and creativity comes from a liberal arts mentality. Mm, of course, it's that simple. Okay, let's talk more about STEM and what we can do to continue that path. STEM, of course, is science, technology, engineering, and math. Right. Because what we're seeing with STEM, especially with our girls, is there's a pipeline, but it's leaking. Right. Explain the leaky pipeline concept. So the leaky pipeline is that uh, we lose more women as girls before they get to college, in college, from the point of graduating into retention in the field, they leak out of the, the career Why? pipeline. Why? Well, I think there, there are several reasons. The first is that women still find science not to be particularly welcoming. I, I have to admit that I probably agree with you. Yeah. I mean, if I'm speaking with someone and, uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm an engineer and it's a woman, I think, oh. That's yeah. interesting. And I consider myself fairly enlightened. Well, it's, I think yeah. the really uh, interesting study most recently that came out was for a Yale study. And they right. looked at um, uh, unconscious biases, right? So they sent out a CV of a recent science grad to research institutions and had the faculty respond to say, would they hire this person and what would the starting salary be? Oh, no. And what they found was if the CV was labeled as John, that John got selected over Jennifer more often than not and got offered a salary higher than Jennifer, even though the CV was exactly the same. And you know, the, the interesting thing is there was no correlation with gender, age of the professor, so even, tenure or not. Even the, the, the yes. woman human resources yes. manager was dinging. Well, no, not the resources manager, the actual faculty members in the sciences. No, I'm so well, I think the point of that is, is how deeply ingrained it is in us, this, these gender schemas, the way we view. Even women. Yeah. Even it's, women have those biases yeah. as much as we try. It's, and it's shocking. I think when um, you first confront that even as a woman you might have that bias, it's a shocking but at least Feeling. we could admit it yes. and work on it. Yes. In our final moments, Madam President, I want to get a sense from you about your views on single sex education most generally, both before college and during college. Well, certainly at college, we can tell you the Women's College Coalition has a lot of data on the fact that women from women's colleges graduate having had more leadership opportunities, more engaged in their studies, Hillary and more Clinton? confident. Hillary Clinton, <laughs> Madeline, Albright, uh, Madeline Albright, Gabby Giffords, who's one so, of our alumni. Oh. So, how, is, how is that? Gabby's doing yeah, well. Right, Gabby and Mark doing well. Right. But, you know, certainly more confident in their ability to move forward. And in, in certainly in the sciences, the retention in science is higher for women from women's colleges. Really? Than so that leaky pipeline leaks less? Absolutely. And this is true for women um, who graduate from uh, girls' high schools. So let's talk about that, high schools, because I mentioned to you, I'm struggling. Should I send my daughters yeah. to a single sex high school or junior high school for that matter? Well, and I think in high school, it's. It, it's really a critical time, right? Because if they're with other women and other girls in a science classroom, they're less worried about how they're coming across socially. Are they gonna be labeled by a guy in the class as aggressive, assertive, smarty nerd. pants, a nerd, right, whatever it is. Mm. So I think that that environment is particularly powerful, and there's some really good work on this by Linda Sachs at UCLA. She talks about this, and great work out of London on this as well. It has been my honor to have met the president of Scripps College. Her name is Lori Bettison Varga, and um, thank you so much for thank what you're doing you. for my the pleasure. women, the girls, the men no. of America. <laughs> my <laughs> name you. is Brad Palmer. So when we come back, we'll be speaking with Nancy Hart, a female councilwoman from the city of Riverside. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. Our guest, Nancy Hart, member of the Riverside City Council. And I'd like to speak with you, uh, Madam Hart, about the changes in the City Hall of Riverside. We know that for the first time in, God, 20 years, you have a new mayor, Ron Luffridge, a legend, not only in Riverside, but California, the nation. He had been chair of the National League of Cities, has retired. You have a new mayor, Rusty Bailey, a young high school teacher who had been a fellow council member yourself. Look back at Mr. Loveridge, look forward at Mr. Bailey. Well, Ron was always somebody who you knew um, had always done his homework. He, right. had, um, he had people that really had faith in him no matter where he went, no matter what level he was on. He always uh, carried himself with gravitas yes. and a plum. And what's interesting is it was gravitas without intimidation. Exactly, and um, dignity. Mm -hmm. And it's a um, it's a formidable role when you need to deal with the White House and so right. on as a real um, leader. Leader. I mean, he was the president of the National League of Cities. I mean, this is a major position. It is, and when I what yeah. I said to myself is, oh, those folks up there are going to realize how much they don't know mm. about being an a city official. Right. And what's interesting about Mr. Loveridge is a registered Democrat mm -hmm. in a region that when he was winning was much more Republican. Um, things have changed as we know, so, but be that as it may, he had bipartisan support. Absolutely. Uh, and he never carried it on his sleeve. He right. never, he never put his party uh, out there. Right. It was more of one of those things, how did you vote? Right. What party are, do you belong to? It isn't a real issue on the city right. level. And what's most interesting is in 20 years as mayor, he never issued a veto. Right. And what does that say? That he was weak or that he somehow oh, no. figured it out in advance? I think it was that he didn't want to be seen as someone who pushed his weight around right. and and that it was really the council's decision. But he worked behind the but scenes. But he did. In, in the best he, sense. He did in the best sense. And when he did threaten to use right. his gavel, we all decided that maybe we ought to take a second look. No doubt. That we missed something. And I think about the horrible events, I believe, of 1998. Mm -hmm. You were not on the council yet no. when there was a shooting inside council chambers. Yeah. Uh, no deaths, fortunately. Mr. Loveridge was hit. Uh, Councilman Beatty was seriously wounded. And who was the other council member that was hit? Um, Laura. Yeah. In and, her leg. And, yes. and, so, and she still uh, carries right. that with her and today. And so how has that impacted the council as we move forward? I think that those of us who weren't there probably are not impacted. Uh, sure. We know about it, we think about it, but we really weren't involved emotionally. Right. And I think that uh, we took all of the um, uh, security of out course. and put the police back there right. instead. Right. And I think that Ron's idea was that City Hall should be open to all mm. and you shouldn't feel intimidated when you walk in the door you should know that this is your government right. and this is, this is and the majority of us feel that way right. and so we we just took them out. Let's look forward to yes. Rusty Bailey, a fellow council member yes. of yours. I would mention you did not endorse in that race. I did not. Yeah, which was rare. Most of the members <laughs> did endorse, but that's fine. Talk to us about Rusty. It's been but a few weeks, but talk Rusty to us. Rusty is um, an interesting <laughs> guy. I think that uh, from the first couple of meetings, he's done well. He's uh, taken command. Right. He has good people around him, and they Interestingly, will. Interestingly, a lot of the same people from the Loveridge years. Absolutely. Well, I think there's transition time, right. and I think it will serve him well to realize that you can't learn it all in a week. Of course. You know, and you need a little bit of um, a little bit of time to adjust. Right. And I think that. Partly that is, uh, Maureen is going to be his, I think, chief of staff. She had been a council member. And she's also right. been a chief of staff of course, for a while. Of course. So I think. Is it odd to have someone who was sitting next to you now sitting above you? No, not really, because he's been mayor pro tem. Right. And so it, it, no, it's not. I think when we're all on the same page, everything works good. Right. We're all happy to have, and, I think he's got a good personality. Right. The city really, the 
constituents really right. like him. Young energy, young family, won almost 60% of the vote. So right. the city seems to be behind the they Bailey are. administration. They are, yes, absolutely. And, and so are we. I've spoken with Mayor Bailey, and while he has nothing bad to say about Ron Loveridge, um, there is a sense that maybe it's time for the new mayor to look in as opposed to look out as Ron leveraged it so effectively. You know, get, get the house in order here before we join national organizations. What do you think of that? I think it's important for him mm. uh, to get his feet wet in those organizations right. a little oh, at a time. Right, yes. Uh, whether I think the city needs to look inward right. or not. In the best sense. I mean, I don't I understand yeah, that, yeah. yeah but uh, I think that the... Um, the nature of politics right now is to go a little regional. That's true. That's true. And 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 when you like write for a grant, they want right. to know how many other people sure. are you dealing with. Well, let's talk about the region because I think it's fair to say that Riverside is looking a lot better than oh San Bernardino, who has declared bankruptcy, Harupa Valley, and Eastvale, two new cities that are on the verge of maybe disincorporation. How is that impacting the region, Riverside? Well, I think San Bernardino is probably its own worst enemy, mm. and I find that tragic. Uh, but they also have issues. They have a lot of uh, people on welfare. They have a mm. lot of that. A lot of their money has moved out, and a lot but of their businesses. I have to ask you, if you look at the map, Riverside and San Bernardino are 20 minutes apart. But worlds apart. How? I mean... Why? Why is it that these two cities, so close together, so similar in, you know, at the surface? First of all, they haven't had a Ron. Loveridge, well stated. They haven't had a Ron. Although Mayor Morris... Uh, is a good mayor. Right. He's, but they've had some issues. Yes. They also ha they have an elected... Um, City, city attorney. City attorney, which, which keeps yeah. you in a different right. uh, mode. You you get a different kind of person mm -hmm. when they go through election than they are when they are uh, who you are. Greg right. Priamos keeps all of Greg us. Greg is the current city attorney? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he, Greg, yeah, he, mm -hmm. he keeps us honest. I give you my best advice. If you don't take it, that's your business. But I give you my best right. advice. Whereas I know that the city attorney non -politically, in as a rule. San Bernardino, Mr. Penman, has taken a different approach. He, he has. And, and it causes uh, dissension. It causes dissension in the public, mm -hmm. which means that when they go to vote, they're, they're one-sided. Right. A lot well, of four, three sided, votes. It, it doesn't bode well. Mm -hmm. And people in our community sometimes say, why are you always 7 and 0, 5 and 0, 6 and 0? Right. I said, if we aren't on the same page, of course. that means that something's wrong. Not that something's wrong when we are. We should all of want course. the best for Riverside. So given that there are so many neighboring cities that are struggling, does it hurt chances for regional collaboration? Well, it does only because they're not able to step out right. because they don't know what's coming. Right. And uh, it's, it's unfair, it's unfair uh, to paint them with a brush that, oh, they don't know what they're doing, when in fact, the state pulled the rug out from That's under them. That's for the new cities, East Vale and Harupa Valley with the VLF. Yes, because uh, Menifee and, and right. Wildemar, the, and Wildemar mm -hmm. they got their money and their VLF and, and oh, so the new, on. No, those are the cities before, even before that. Yes, yes. and uh -huh. so they were taken care mm -hmm. of in mm -hmm. the way they should have been. Right. And they, they have left East Vale and, mm -hmm. and uh, Harupa Valley, Valley uh, out. As, and it's as, hurt. As you conclude your final term, what are your goals? I haven't really made any goals. I would kind of like to be out from under the clock, mm. out from under the calendar of mm -hmm. someone else. Mm. I've been doing this for through my Finish PTA your, days, right. my school board days, and my council days. So uh, I want to do my own thing. I want to go travel. back to being a volunteer. Right. Went to Europe this summer. I love that. And uh, Well, you have many fans in the city of Riverside and beyond. Her name is Nancy Hart. She is a member of the Riverside City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. We thank you so much for watching Charter, California Edition.